Elena is going to help because unfortunately I don't speak Ariana. The only word I know in and Portuguese, yes. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to all of you for helping Vinho Cobos to become the company that it is. As, as I think uh, you heard Jose say, Brazil is a major market for Vinho Cobos wines, and it's with your passion and support that really underpin the work that we do. So it's a privilege to be back in Sao Paulo and uh, always feel good coming here. Of course, some of you may know I actually met my wife here in Sao Paulo over 10 years ago. And um, even though she's not from Sao, Sao Paulo, she's from Germany, so <laughs> I just think things happen. <laughs> so as Jose mentioned, um, perhaps to give you some context, um, we give us some background as to what it was like 35 years ago in March of 1988 when I first made my my first visit into uh, the Mendoza region of Argentina. And uh, some of you may be thinking, well, I had an intention to come to Argentina and work, or I was invited by someone to work in Argentina. Well, in a way I was but I didn't know it. Here's what happened in, in a nutshell. I was at a point in my career, I was roughly in my mid-30s, and I worked on the original Opus One winemaking team in 1979, and I spent six, six years with Robert Mondavi, well actually seven in total, six years with Opus, and then I left that winery and working with the Manavi family to join Simi Winery, which is in Sonoma County, in a town called Healdsburg. And we were owned by basically the import arm of Moet et Chandon. That company was based in New York City and their name was uh, Shefflin and Somerset. And in 19... 86, roughly, 1987, a new company was formed that we all know today as LVMH, Louis Vuitton Lloyd Hennessy, and we became thus part of that large, we're now what is known as the world's largest luxury company. And I thought, well, this is an amazing opportunity to be in the upper ranks of a company. Now I'm going to sit on the board, etc. But I didn't realize that that was going to be a kind of kind of a time-consuming event and took me away from my real passion, which was being in the kitchen making wine. And that caused me to kind of reconsider my career. I was also, you know, there, you, we all come, I suppose, to a point in our, you could call it an inflection point or a crossroad, where you just wonder, well, what's my next steps? And I always enjoyed traveling the path less well traveled. So I decided, well, what's new on the horizon? And frankly, there was a lot of chatter about the work going on in Chile at that time. This is again in the late 80s. I had looked at Eastern Europe as well as a possible place to go to make a difference, to do something that might matter to their industry. And then finally though, I settled on Chile and I had a classmate friend of mine, Marcelo Kogan, who has earned his PhD at the same university where I did my master's work, the University of California in Davis. And Marcelo had gone back to be the head of the department at the University of Santiago. And so I asked if he would be kind enough to set up a week visits. We were good friends of all the wineries in Chile that he thought were worth visiting. And so that's what he did. And I made my trip there. but. I did make a mistake. Actually, you might call it a fatal mistake, although I'm still here to tell about it. So, and that is, I divide. I invited an Argentine to Chile. 
And that actually sounded sort of laugh laughable to me when I heard from my host that I had committed a mortal sin. <clears throat> that bringing an Argentine into Chile during the period of Pinochet and after the Falk Falkland Island Wars and the border disputes, no Argentine was really truly welcomed in Chile, according to my host. So he forbid me to take my visitor, who was also going to be my translator, by the way, uh, to see any of the wineries that he had organized. However, this uh, individual, I told him, well, I have to disinvite you because of this situation. And, but my, my visitor refused to, to leave. In other words, something we call, an individual we would call a stalker. So after three, three and a half days, I, my host got fed up with the fact that this gentleman was not leaving and threw us both out of his, well, I, I was staying at his home, but basically that played very well in my visitor's hands because my visitor was Jorge Catena, the younger brother of Nicholas Catena. What I didn't know is that Nicholas had sent Jorge on a mission. His mission was to come to Chile and return only returned to Argentina if he brought me back into Mendoza. So in the end, I guess you could say Nicholas was successful and so was Jorge. Mm -hmm. So on Friday of that week, we drove over the, these mountains and there's where I had my first encounter with a grape variety I'd never seen before, as we all know today, Malbec. And frankly, uh, the vineyard, I was one of, probably one of the very first visitors to drive over the Andes. Most folks would tend to fly in the Mendoza from Buenos Aires or Santiago, but I made the trip over the Andes. And that was informative, because then I could see how the mountains could play possibly an idea of the soils, because what was one of the problems of the perception of Argentina during that period by the international community? Essentially, most pundits and most wine experts coming from California or other parts of the world considered Argentina to be too hot to grow high quality or fine wine grapes. And I suppose that made sense if you considered that they would land in Mendoza and drive by auto out or by a car out into the east where most of the viticulture and most of the winemaking was being done. So at that time, Argentina was the fifth largest producer of wine in the world. This is March 88, harvest of 88 that I showed up. And I saw this vineyard and I thought, well, this vineyard is actually better than any vineyard that I saw during my three and a half days before I got, or four days before I got disinvited, than I've seen in Chile. Most of the plantings in Chile were very wide spacing. And the soil is much heavier. I said, well, these are gorgeous soils, well-drained, alluvial, all the things that we all know today. So the only conclusion is it truly must be too hot to grow fine, high-quality wine grapes. And so that is where we left it. We drove out to Bodega Ses Morales, which was the Catena winery in a little town called La Libertad in the east. And there I got to taste some of their wines. And they lived up to their international reputation. I was told, when you go to Argentina, all you're going to taste are pumped wines. In other words, <clears throat> quite bad wines. And frankly, I have to agree, they were the worst wines I'd ever tasted in my entire life. Well, of course, I was then flown to Buenos Aires to meet Nicholas Catena, and that started our, our relationship together. I became the architect of their program in 89. I left my work at CIMI, and I started the Paul Hobbs Winery in 1991. And you might say, similar to the Warren Buffett Charles Munger relationship, where Warren Buffett was basically the contractor, and that was Nicholas's role, my role was Mr. Munger to be the architect, to basically design it. And so Nicholas told me, and this is sort of the lead in, he wanted to make Chardonnay. And in that period of time in 
California, there was a revolution in the way we were making Chardonnay. The dramatic changes that were under play. And I was quite fascinated by the fact, well, why would you want to make Chardonnay in a country that's already deemed to be too warm? <clears throat> because as we all know, Chardonnay is a cold climate varietal. Maybe not quite as cold as Riesling. But Nicholas Riesling, if we can prove to the Americans that we can grow high quality whites, then they'll automatically accept that we can grow high quality reds. So we're going to make Chardonnay. And that is kind of how it all began. Very quickly, what I discovered on my next visit in 89, are some of the challenges that I would face in viticulture primarily, but also in winemaking. I think you all know at that period of time, Argentina was just still an isolationist country. There had been isolationist policies or protectionist policies for over 40 years. Catena had a little bit of an inside view on that, so he knew that, that those policies were to change, which they did in the early 90s. And Argentina opened and dropped its protectionist policies. That worked out very well for the timing of my appearance. And so, from that point of view, Argentina really, truly wasn't even interested in export because though the fifth largest producer was consuming every drop of wine they made, which was remarkable considering, however, very little of the wine was under cork. In fact, only a couple of thousand cases in the whole country was made under cork in the late 1980s. They were bottled in either dem demijohns or demijohns of three and five liter, or tetra brick, and typically wine was cheaper than Coca-Cola. And by the way, one other thing you might want to know, there wasn't any wine, except maybe a few bottles made here and there, that weren't oxidized. All wines, because their equipment was so antiquated, so the equipment situation, I saw equipment in Mendoza that I wouldn't imagine I'd expect to see in a French museum. Very ancient. And basically it was knockoff equipment because of their inability to be able to import. And sometimes I look at, actually the government is behaving the same way now as it did back then. So things haven't changed that much with the old expression the more things change, the more they stay the same. So Argentina in some ways has reverted back to the 1980 policies. <laughs> At any rate, what I could see in the beginning, which was easy to see, was that the soils were excellent and also the infrastructure was very poor. Infrastructure we could change. <clears throat> the plantings of the vineyards were high density. That was very good. But it was also very clear that they were over irrigated and they were over fertilized. So, and the last major problem that we had to overcome was how to give the growers confidence to grow high quality grapes. Because the only thing the industry was interested in was quantity, there was no drive for quality. And growers had no incentive to grow high quality. So what did they do? They pumped water. Malbec drinks like a camel. It literally has the hydraulics and the ability to balloon. The skin can stretch and swell very quickly, as a matter of fact. Cabernet, for example, is a relatively dry berry. So what did, we'll get to this in a little more detail later. But I just want to say, well, that's one of the, some of the things we had to do. We introduced drip irrigation. We introduced, we introduced the net to help growers feel more comfortable to weather the hailstorms of the third worst region of the world for these kind of storms, which is sort of obvious when you think about it, when you have the Andes, the second tallest mountain range in the world. And then what happens, of course, is you form these monsters <coughs> in their heads with cold or warm moist air coming off the pampas, being undercut by the cold air sliding off the ice fields of the Andes, forming huge thunderheads that then rain down incredible hailstorms in the evenings. So the growers, without any other form of protection, they had Russian rockets, they had various tools, but none of them were very effective. 
So essentially, we have to give them a better tool, otherwise we're going to cocoon all the fruit inside the shoots. And so the, the fruit was, everything was designed, was designed like a Hershey's Kiss candy. The chocolate or the fruit was all inside the wrapper, and then the wrapper was wrapped on a low wire to seal it all in, and the fruit was grown as close to the ground as possible. In fact, when they irrigating, I've never seen anything like this, the water going down was flood irrigation or, or furrow irrigation would tickle the bottom of the, of the clusters so they would all flutter as the water passed down the road. It was something unique. But you can, you can imagine the quality of fruit grown in those conditions. So those are things that we have to change. And, uh, <clears throat> well, we know that curiosity killed the cat. And, uh, yeah, my curiosity nearly got me killed. <laughs> well, frankly, during my first work session, one of the great Fridays, as I meant, we've already talked some about and all that. <clears throat> what frankly happened when the U.S. press was present in March of 1993, thanks to Chardonnay. I had secretly been making Malbec in 10 American oak, new American oak barrels in the back of the winery without telling anyone, well, mainly I wasn't telling me to ask container. <clears throat> and the reason I was doing that is I was simply curious if this variety could be made in a way that would demonstrate mobility, and we'll talk about what that means in a moment. And so, you might think that's sort of odd, because it isn't Argentina the leader in Malbec around the world today? And the answer, of course, it is. However, it didn't come easy. It, basically, the producers considered Malbec in those days to be a low quality blending variety, and they were only looking for volume. So some of the great old vineyards were being discarded and removed because they didn't create sufficient quantity or production. So that was happening in the 70s and in the 80s when I arrived. Old Vine Melbeck, which would be treasured, and is a treasure today in Argentina, was considered a liability and was being removed, excavated. And I asked Nicholas Catena, this is basically in 1990, 1991, at over lunch one day, if I could do some experiments on Melbeck to see if it had, quote, the qualities of mobility, if it could be made into a noble varietal and make a noble wine. And Nicholas said, no, that would be a total waste of time. And he, then, he showed me in his study, we, we left the lunch or the table for lunch, and we went into his study in his home, his childhood home in La Libertad, and he showed me in a book that the French did not replant Malbec after Phylloxera struck their vineyards in the 1870s. And Nicholas' conclusion was, well, that's because the variety, there were better varieties. But in fact, that wasn't the reason. The French deemed Malbec correctly to be a fickle variety to grow and difficult to set a crop, and they didn't want a second economic challenge after facing phylloxera. So I want to be clear about that. Malbec, during spring conditions, during flowering, can be very fastidious, and if it's not provided good weather, it won't set a crop. I have great experience with this so basically the French decided, let's go with the sheer thing, Cabernet Sauvignon. So if you look at the classification of 1855 in Bordeaux, and you look at the old records of the blends that were made, by example, for example, Chateau de Tour, their blends contained more than 55% Malbec. Cabernet, by the way, was a relatively new cross, between Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. So, 
Hence, this thing was really, the Cabernet was a very, very reliable set. In other words, you could always guarantee that you were going to have a crop. I went ahead and asked Pedro Marchewski, the head of vineyards for Catena, while Catena lived in Buenos Aires, I figured, well, what's the problem with just taking a little bit of the vineyard and modifying it and farming it a little bit differently to see if we could grow the grape in a high quality way, restrict water, restrict inputs, open up the canopy, what would be the harm in that? And that's how we ended up making 10 barrels. That led to <coughs> This particular moment in March of 1993, when after they had tasted the Chardonnay, I said, hey, one more thing. I have a, a little surprise in the corner of the winery. And that is when we, well, basically, then showed the U.S. press, Melvick, aged American oak barrels. And one of the wine writers, Tom Stockley, who wrote for the Seattle Times, wrote an article, don't cry for me, Argentina. And after the main, of course, he was he was paid to write about the Chardonnay. He had come there to do that, and he did that. But at the end of the article, he said, but I think maybe the real discovery on my trip was that Malbec could be a lead variety for Argentina. And how prophetic, when you think about it, his words were. But Nicholas was having nothing to do with that. So, his importer, Alfredo Bartolomeus, put a lot of pressure to bring a red. So Nicholas decided we're going to bring Cabernet Sauvignon, which was a well-known variety around the world. It made sense what he was saying. But we hadn't prepared Cabernet Sauvignon, and we hadn't prepared a red. So we launched the Cabernet, but it was thrown together, and it was a very poor quality, and it failed. That didn't help the cause for Cabernet. Then Nicholas said, well, I'm getting so much pressure, please do something or leave this as a... He didn't want to put it under the container name, so he suggested I create a new wine. And that gave rise to Alamos, and I became the first importer of Alamos. Though I had never wanted to be an import company, but Nicholas convinced me that being an importer was easy work. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, if there's any employees in the room, you might think differently as well, but he, I had no knowledge of what that meant. He said, well, Paul, you're the only one that can convince the Americans to try the Melbourne. And so his reasoning was pretty sound, and hence the name Alamos came, and we began importing that wine in the late 1994-1995, and initially, the Americans didn't even realize that Argentine, Argentina produced wine. So when I first sold that wine to the U.S. market, the response I was would get after explaining to them what part of Argentina, Mendoza, a little bit about Argentina, the history of Argentina, and Malbec, the answer or the response I would get to my introduction was, "What part of Chile did you say that that was?" There was no association with the U.S. market with Argentina. At any rate, Viña Cobos was essentially started to build upon the work that I had done in the beginning under the, um, the Catena umbrella. And so, and I really, it was a very simple mission that, that we had. I was so fascinated by this grape that I decided what I really wanted to do was to study whether it had nobility. And I'm going to define that with two elements. One, could it age? And secondly, could it reflect terroir? Maybe even the highest. And so we began experiments. The reason Vigna Cobos, again, was formed and created was not to become a winery. We needed a vehicle to make wine, of course. But it wasn't even, we weren't even looking to do a, you might say, a business. We were mostly looking like we just want to be a couple of nerds in a garage making different Malbecs from different regions and seeing whether or not this variety has any legs to be noble. <coughs> and that was the basic premise by which we started being Yacobos. Tremendous resistance to go to higher elevation because the community of viticulturists felt that it was too cold to grow high quality wine grapes in what is now known as the Baja de Uco. And it seems preposterous to us today, of course, that that area would be too cold. 
but that is that was the common wisdom of the time. Don't do it at higher elevation. So I had overcome a lot of resistance. What I was doing on the weekend, make wine under a shared facility, because it, in my own experience, when I first visited Burgundy and I read it, and I was visiting places that I read about as a graduate student, I had that tingle come go up your back kind of feeling. You know, these are places that are historical, that have tradition, and that have shaped my life. And so that is one of the, probably the main reasons that we have chosen the Burgundian model as a model that we think is important. Todas estas especies conviven con el viñedo. En el año 2013, Paul llega a Chañares de la mano de un ingeniero agrónomo, Negro Vin, que era un ingeniero agrónomo muy reconocido en Mendoza, y ve Chañares y se conmovió mucho por ese viñedo. Entonces decide comprarlo. A partir de ese momento, Viñacobos lo maneja como si fuera propio, es propio de Paul Cox, pero es como si fuera nuestro. Of course, we also have the situation with climate change. That's another element that we also live with and work with on a daily basis. But in terms of style shifts in wine, the way we eat, the way people eat around the world, the way they drink, that all changes and is influenced, influenced by factors that, well, sometimes it's under the control of one individual. I would say in the case of that, an example of that would be Robert Parker. He alone changed the way almost everyone on the planet drank for a period of time, and for that reason, also the way wines were made. But there's been a strong backlash, if you will, against that approach, because that approach kind of obliterated drinkable wines. They were big and powerful and jammy and heavily oaked. They were bled and they were out of balance. But he loved those kinds of wines and gave them high scores, and those high scores allowed the producers to raise their prices and build reputation for them. So that's a critique, you might say, of Mr. Parker, but that's his taste. And I'm not blaming him for that, that's just a phenomenon that occurred. In fact, I think he did a lot of good for the industry, and he certainly brought a lot of people that weren't wine drinkers into the world of wine. And I know a number of CEOs, I'm not sure of this one, but a number of CEOs that knew nothing about wine and, uh, and then became wine connects mainly because of Parker. So, yeah, is there a swing toward, let's say, the expression of terroir, a more judicious and restrained use of oak? Absolutely. More energy. Are we looking for sites that have and express better acidity, more freshness? One of the things about the Chinari's vineyard, as a matter of fact, is that the water that we use to irrigate that vineyard comes from a depth of nearly 200 meters. It's in an aquifer that's been never touched. And the water comes out of the ground at eight to 10 degrees Celsius. It holds more oxygen, more freshness. That gives vitality to the plants. I mean, you just can't change that. I mean, that's something, that's a God a gift by God. And the fact that we work in Argentina with very pure air, high elevation, I mean, it's, you know, when you go there, you can see the difference, the clarity, the way the sun and hits the mountains, etc., etc. Imagine being a vine. We might say, well, why does it matter to a vine if it grows there or on the valley floor or in smog or whatever? You no, know, it matters. It's a living thing. And the grape is finally a sink for all that the vine uptakes. So, being where we are in California, or where we are in New York, we look for these remote sites that are not industrial sites, that have good quality air. Being near the, the Pacific Ocean, for example, really means that what the vine gets is the same kind of environment that you would want to grow and raise your family, and you would want to live in. So yeah, so are we making wines that sort of go that way? Absolutely. We want them to really express like, we remember as kids, or at least I remember as a child, eating wild berries from the mountains, and the natural flavor when you pick them at the peak of ripeness, how amazing that flavor is. And now that we go to the store and we get something that's actually been maybe ripened in a warm, a hot house or a cold environment, we know it looks good, but it's kind of woody in texture and it's kind of flavorless. And so what do we do to make it taste better? pour on some sugar or this or that to kind of make it more interesting. 
We are going back in time to the old days and celebrating the old ways of wine, wine making. And you can say Armenia is part of one of the reasons I'm working there. Again, the path less traveled. We're seeing that these old techniques truly have value and those show up in the wine. And so that's it. That's your I think that's one of the future trends that we're really you might say it's a journey into the past. Thank you. <laughs> yes.